He only recently died. Jimmy DeQuisto. Yeah. yeah. He's one who actually did the job. Oh, okay. Well, we went to pick it up. Me and my dad and I went to pick it up. And it was great. He called and said, the banjo's ready. We went there and it was John giving me the banjo. My dad paid for it and all that. So, but of course, Jimmy made some great guitars. He was awesome. Change, do you? I don't, I don't think, think so. Know. No, I don't think so. I asked his son Ernie. But I, met said, you, go ahead. I met you, Parker, on uh, Martha's Vineyard. Really? Well, he had sent me uh, about two years before he died uh, a little pamphlet saying rhymes for the irreverent. <laughs> and one of these ones, I couldn't, I liked the idea of the words, but I couldn't think of two, but but he would have been a hundred some 16 years later. Uh, Ernie says, won't you try harder to find a tune? So I, I got a tune for it. Here's, the, here's his words. How are you Oh, don't tell me I can't remember it. Technic show 
with blazing hydrogen glow and thermal nuclear gases. Thank God this great combustion day is several million years away. So as philosophers all say, why fret, why fume, why worry? The jillion moons will wane and wax. Sit down and make out your income tax. Enjoy your life, be calm, relax. For God is in no hurry. But oh, my friends, I have a hunch. Mankind might be God to watch. Have a happy at age 82. Beautiful. You want to play that too? I may do tonight, yeah. That book I brought out was so full of mistakes that 20 years ago I said to sing out, don't reprint it. But it took me 20 years to correct hundreds of little mistakes and some of them very big mistakes, like the story of Wimoyer. But I didn't really know the full story. I thought the guy who wrote it got the copyrighters that the royalty was supposed to get. But he only got about 25%. He did get something, but you can play that song today. 25%. Pete, you can play that song today? The line slips. Yeah, the line. Well, then George Weiss put it way down the key of C, and so you can't sing the bass part. And I thought the bass part was one of the wonderful things about the song. Yeah. But they don't ever sing it. They just sing. Uh, uh, what is it? They sing these three words. When in the jungle, the mighty jungle, the lion sleeps tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, however, I have to, George Weiss is very sick now, but he made millions of his songs. You know, he wrote out this freshly great hit, uh, I Can't Help Falling in Love With You. Yeah. You know what he did? He rewrote an old, old French song. You know, plaisir de more. Yes, yeah. And George rewrote the first line. Eventually, somebody's going to find the same notes and think they made them up. My father had a musicologist friend who claimed there really were basically six melodies in Europe. <laughs> <laughs> Everything has a variation. <laughs>
finally. He ought to stay away from writing a book. But he, it was just a collection of the papers he'd read at society, Musicological Society meetings. And the last pa paper was called On the Folkness of the Non-Folk and the Non-Folkness of the Folk. <laughs> and the last sentence says, Thus we may see that musically speaking, the population of the United States can be divided into two classes, which is a, a jive at his old communist friends. <laughs> the world's divided into capitalists or workers. Uh, uh, those who do not know that they are a folk and those who do not think they are a folk. <laughs> <laughs> We're all folks. We're all folks. We're musicians. You're what? 
and then they bring out the violin and the cord. And well, we've all learned. And my father says, actually, we need some place we can camp out for the winter because the roads are so bad we can't get back north again. And this was, this was in Pinehurst, North Carolina. And they bought for a couple of dollars in an Army Navy store squad tent, 16 feet square, and put a, uh, logs around the, the base so he could stand up in it more easily. I was in a squad tent in World War II. Wow. Uh, you had eight, eight men sleeping. But then, anyway, the five, was, and they had a little stove they got in the center. One night they take their classical music up to the farmhouse, the Mackenzie family, and show them what they did. Kenzie's were very polite. They said, oh, that's very nice. We play a little music, too. And he took out banjos and fiddles and played up a storm. And my father said, for the first time in my life, I realized, realized the people had a lot of good music. They didn't need my good music as much as I thought. <laughs> he was going to take music to people who had no music. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Pete, you said that your father became a pessimist at the end of his life. Was well, he, was he an optimist most of his life? Uh, he'd be got so interested in some project. Once he and, he and my brother put together what they called a mellow graph, and a moving piece of paper went along, and a needle went up and down, showing the exact pitch of every note that came into the microphone. You'd have a, a person play a violin or a fiddle or sing, and you can get the vibratos and everything. The only trouble is, it was a, only an expert could read it. Right. Uh, but he was very enthusiastic about that for a while. Yeah. And when the 60s came along, he had a big sign uh, in his bedroom saying, Make love, not war. That's, <laughs> That's great. Wow. Oh, he lived on the same street in Santa Monica with some rock band that was quite well known. And when they wanted to have a picture for their cover, they invited all the neighbors in. And he was in the picture too. <laughs> rock band. Unfortunately, about a half a block from the ocean in Santa Monica. He, uh, he did yoga exercises all his life. Uh, and uh, when he was about 90, he had an appointment with a young musicologist, and she came and found a sign on the door saying, come in, the door is unlocked, uh, but I won't hear you knocking uh, until I put my hearing aid on. Uh, so, uh, but I'll be down at nine o'clock. Well, she's sitting there on the sofa, and here's upstairs. <laughs> Heaven, she said, the old man's having a heart attack. And she runs upstairs to find him rolling around on the floor, stark naked doing his yoga exercise. <laughs> wild, wild. Unbelievable. I seen a lady carrying a sign at the, one of the peace marches. She says, the sign says, more fucking less fighting. <laughs> Pete, my, my wife's boss runs a school for autistic kids. Right. Um, I would call it Sorgatis, just about, you know, the next town over. And my wife, Juliet, is a, a school psychologist. She's not a teacher, so she's the one who evaluates the kids, you know. I mean, it's a fairly good sized school, it's been there for a while. And uh, her husband plays a terrific mandolin player and singer, bluegrass singer, in the same bluegrass band from Woodstock that, that Bill's in. Oh, nice. And they're here today. And she was one, they would, of course, would love to meet you, and she would like to ask you something. Um, was, was it, would that be okay with you when the concert's over? Sure. She would think, you know, they're long time fans. Yeah. And, um, I'm just wondering where, um, just mm -hmm. uh, with them was a young English fellow oh, yeah. who has made a statue of you, oh, having no. seen you on Ringo Quest. 
and it's uh, sitting and playing the banjo and that's kind of it's very very nice fantastic like you love it's it. about this big it. it's great and uh, he, he brought it here from England uh, oh. and using a pet carrier you know one of those little pet carriers <laughs> and uh, yeah he has it here and uh, he's a banjo player so I don't know the Sorry. Uh, he puts it on the pet cabinet under the seat. I yeah. guess so, yeah. yeah. Wow. He had to take the head off to get it in the box and put it back on when he got here. Yeah. Yeah. You, you like it. It's nice. really, really good. It's, it could be nobody but you. Really. Do you uh, have ever you have been driven up the little road to the west from West Saugerties? You go up this winding road up a ravine, and after you get about a mile up, they have a a waterfall, I think it's called Hell's Kitchen. Is that Platt Clove? Platt Clove? Just before you get to Haynes Falls. Just before? Oh, oh I know, yes. I know, I know. It's, um... Spanish Hill is north. That's it. Isn't that that very bad road to get to? No, it's a terrible road. road. Yeah, that's one. But, uh, Truckers get uh, halfway in and have to back out. And my daughter Tina, who drove us here today, uh, she went up with me. And we slept out right at the edge of a cliff. It was foolish if we, you know, we'd woken up in the night and to take a leak or something. We could step. Very up. steep, right? Very steep. It goes down a hundred feet to the. I mean, but the road is very yeah, steep. Very steep. That's Platte Clove. I know exactly where it is. It's hard on, tough on a motorcycle. Yeah. It's a dangerous yeah. road. And if you fall down in that ravine there, that's it. You're yeah. not coming out because it's, the walls are like this. Yeah. And at the top of it, there's, no a, there's a waterfall. And it's Haines, like a Walls. Haines Walls. Haines Walls. Haines Walls. Yeah. yeah, that's fantastic. It goes up. You can get to, to it through Palinville. If you go up towards Palinville and then go west. Uh, that's, yeah. Do you know that's where the words of Guantanamera were written? No. Marti made his living as a journalist. And he was living in New York at this time, it was 1891, and he was making himself sick with indecision because he says, uh, I want independence for Cuba, but I don't want to hurt Spain, Spain's the mother country. Uh, and if we do get independence, how do we keep Cuba out of the claws of the great eagle of the North? <laughs> I think that a poetic way is. <laughs> well, the doctor said, as far as you're making yourself sick with indecision, Go up the country, go walking in the woods, get your health back. That's the most important thing. Where did they go? Up to Haynes Falls. They had a railroad then. Go to Phoenicia and turn north and wiggle your way up to Haynes Falls. And he got a room in a, a boarding house or some place for the summer. And over the next two or three months, he wrote about 150 short verses, uh, four lines apiece. 60 years, no. Yes, almost 60 years. In 49, a classical musician, uh, he'd been spent his childhood in Spain because his parents made a living as classical musicians in Spain, but he came back to where he was born in, in Cuba and started relearning the folk music of Cuba, which he left as a child. And every afternoon on the air, uh, he'd hear this melody played by a guy named Joseito. He'd say, well, folks, uh, here's Jose Ito, and let's see who was caught in the wrong bed. Well, let's see who's <laughs> caught in the, with his hand in the till. And he'd improvise verses to the tune of Guantanamera, because the tradition of this song was to make up verses wherever you were. And it had started with satirizing the women of Guantanamo who went out with the American sailors. and. Uh, so it'd say, oh, where were you last night? Guantanamera. What were you doing? Guantanamera. You know, oh, I bet you did this. <laughs> See how disgusting you could get. <laughs> but uh, this classical musician, uh, name was Julian Orban. And he happened to be reading Marti and realized that Marti's philosophical verses fitted this melody. Uh, now he used, uh, could, oh, they said all of Marti's verses have been printed in a book called Versos Sencillos, Simple Verses. And all, all he did was repeat the first two lines and it fitted the melody perfectly. And 
Uh, he taught it, the song to one of his 12-year-old piano students, Hector Angulo was his name. Well, uh, 